Howdy. This is a notification I got maybe today, I guess. I have several of them I got in the past, so it's not the first time. Six people on Academia have read your papers. There are many more because this number, I don't know what this six people means because there's like 46 on one paper or something. But anyway, and one of those six people here is a plasma physics researcher. Yeah, why not? Of course, we have plasma physics researcher who is reading my papers. Yeah, there might be something to it. And that's the picture I shared. I shared it also on another platform. Let's see if there's anything. Numerical simulations, numerical modeling and anthropology of space. And as I said before, 46 views. So I don't know where they got this six from. But numerical simulations, numerical modeling and anthropology of space. This sounds very <laughs> fiction scientific. It's not science fiction, it's fiction science. So let's just have a look at my paper. And this is the Academia page. Plate tectonic issues, the influence of electricity in rock forming processes and the coherent connection between science, mythology and history of Finland part 3. In other words, there are still two other parts to this paper. They say that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, but is not half so bad as a lot of ignorance. Terry Pratchett. Huh. Yeah, probably no one would expect a Terry Pratchett quote in a scientific paper, but since I'm not a scientist, I took the freedom to quote whoever I wanted to quote. And since Terry Pratchett uh, was quite a wise man and he was a busy writer, he wrote many books. He wrote many books about witches. And yeah, basically, <laughs> it turned out that I seem to be a witch, according to Terry Pratchett. Yeah, I didn't see that one coming, but let me just show you something which is not related to Terry Pratchett at all. Or maybe not in a way you would expect. Tietea Keskus, strong connection to nature and traditions. Yes, maybe there should be an A at the beginning, but... I think that's related to the Finnish language because they don't use these kind of little words in front of other words. So, Welcome to explore the wisdom cultures around Lake Pielinen of North Karelia, Finland. Yeah, that's where I am. Pielisen Tietäjä Keskus is a non-profit cultural association established in November 2020 in Finland. The name of the association, association derives from two words. Pielinen is a huge sacred lake in North Karelia surrounded by multiple of nature's sacred sites such as the magnificent mountain of Koli, the national landscape of Finland. Yeah, there is a cave with a mighty witch. <laughs> Tietäjä Keskus comes from two words. Tieta, yeah, is the one who knows, a concept similar to that of the shaman. Keskus means center and keeps us connected to the property that we would like to acquire for our work and community. We hope to bring people, creativity and practical ideas together for the purpose of nature, connection and cultural heritage 
by Lake Pielin, and we are in our ancestral lands, where the great wisdom carriers and people have lived in close connection with all the seen and invisible realms of nature. Welcome to join or support our association and connect with our circles. Yeah, I tried. <laughs> I wrote them several times, but they never answered. But anyway, Tieta Keskus comes from two words. Tieta, yeah, is the one who knows, a concept similar to that of the shaman. Yeah, the knower. It's the one who knows. Tieta, yeah. So now let's hop still over to Britannica. Tietäjä, Fino Urgik Shaman. Tietäjä, the principal religious specialist of the Baltic Finns functioning in the tradition of the Fino Urgik Shaman, operating in a more complex agricultural society than his counterparts, such as the Sami Noidi, who worked in a hunting and fishing society. The Tietaya type specialist was distinguished chiefly by the number of roles he mastered, as well as by the degree of specialization exemplified in them. Nevertheless, as a shamanic specialist, the Tietaya's main task was still to act as the community's first line of defense against hostile supernatural forces. Whether they originated in the other world or with scorsesers or other evil minded people. The term Tietaya literally means knower, implying that he, as the specialist, knew more than ordinary humans about the nature of the supernatural world and of the techniques for dealing with it. He could be called on to aid in almost any problem that was either not adequately understood or not amenable. Amenable? Amenable? Anyway, to correction by ordinary means. He was consulted mostly in matters of illness, but he also served as priest, diviner, judge, name giver, spokesman, and entertainer. Even in the position of healer, there was a great deal of specialization in regard to the tasks and techniques used by individual practitioners. The overall status of the Tietaya was also higher in the agricultural society than that of the Nuaiti in the hunting and fishing milieu because of his additional social influence and political power accruing from his multiple roles. It is his role differentiation above all that sets him apart. Noidy. Oh, wow, he did the trick. So, so now if you write science or if you're gonna going to translate science into the Finnish language. You will figure out that it's Tiede. In other words, the Finnish word for science is very deeply rooted and originating from the word which in the same language or in a very close related language. A witch is a knower, and knowing means tieta in Finnish. Tieta, yeah, is something, someone who knows. And if you are a professional and are studying at the university, you are doing science, you are doing tieta, it's the knowing, you are doing the knowledge, it's the same thing, those both words mean actually the same thing as you can see here and if you focus on this word here
and on this one here. They are literally the same. Science. Theater. So it's one thing. Knowing is witchery. This is just one thing. <laughs> which probably makes me a witch. Because I don't have any degree. I haven't been to any university. So I am not a scientist. Now we just talked around the bends. And we didn't made it any further than to the first quote or first words or whatsoever of this paper, which is again, plate tectonic issues, the influence of electricity in rock forming processes and the coherent connection between science, mythology and history of Finland part three. So for those who have the eyes to see, a coffee mug with petroglyphs made by Pentic in the middle. To the left, a Finnish brimstone, and to the right, you see a beautiful example of mineral facies. Yes. Content preface. Keywords. These are the ones I used and the ones which are on academia. I had to choose from what the academia suggested. Preface. Many of the modern sciences exist within the uniform deterministic notion that is, except for the Big Bang, everything happened at a steady pace over millions of years. Every now and then, an asteroid falls on Earth, sometimes with devastating consequences like the extinction of the dinosaurs. Most often they just burn in the atmosphere without anyone noticing it. But otherwise, things happen generally very slowly. When reading or watching something about ancient people, it cannot be overheard how often it is expressed that not only the hominids, humans, but also the animals seem always to struggle to survive. Since the author, yeah, that's me, since the author realized this repetitive pattern once, he got sensitive on this topic. In the author's opinion, this assumption is a totally empty phrase and seems to have only one purpose. Lifting modern men even higher in a strange hierarchy of living beings. We have conquered nature, or science is settled. Our expressions, some seem to believe and take them as absolute truths, without understanding their own lack of critical thinking. Many things which are used to keep our modern society going are not very well understood. Often it is more known about how to use something than about its origins. Most people simply don't care. Many people are also not really aware of what they are saying in terms of everyday language. For example, everyday sayings used by the people. What does it actually mean? Where does it come from? Why is the sun reindeering? There is a big possibility that the animals and peoples of ancient times were thriving in an exceptionally fertile environment where food, water, warmth and light was much more abundant than many could imagine. <clears throat> it might have been a totally different world and stories about the old sun or the good sun only undermine these possibilities. On the other hand, we also have evidence that the past wasn't a forever stable state or time. Many things have changed over the years and it is foolish to believe that nothing is going to change anymore. Many species went extinct but also new ones formed. Every now and then archaeologists find new evidence that ancient people were more advanced than previously assumed, which sometimes poses problems to their interpretations of certain patterns. Geology is also full of contradictions, assumptions and unprovable claims which are often explained away by using extremely long timelines. Sometimes they just seem to not to care too much, there's a word missing, about the contradictions 
And they just move on with, oh, look, a bird kind of attitude. Birds are dinosaurs. They didn't go extinct. They just got smaller. Peat is something most of us are familiar with, at least to some degree. It is found all over the globe and usually related to water. Despite the huge amount of literature about peat, bogs, fans or wetlands in general, the origins and creation of it are not well understood. And it is classified as a geomorphological phenomenon. In other words, they don't really know how it got created or where it came from. When talking about wetlands, we, we have still water not flowing as a key component, which is usually stored in lakes and ponds. According to mainstream scientific theory, some of these water bodies are seen as meteor impact craters. Often they are seen as a result of plate tectonics, but also glaciers might have carved them out. The end of the last ice age seemed to have happened rather quickly in terms of melting. The author thinks that peat might have played a crucial role in some of the melting processes due to its electromagnetic properties. Peat will be the main topic of this paper, but other topics will be discussed as well. Not only because they are interesting, but also to show how, at first glance, seemingly unrelated things are surprisingly similar with each other. Earth provides an ever-changing environment for life in a cyclical manner. It and all the other planets with all their moons are contained within the Sun's magnetosphere. The Sun is nowadays not only geographically the center of our solar system but also energy-wise. This implies that it might have been different in the past. All the planets are constantly connected to the Sun by interplanetary Birkeland currents. The Sun and therefore all the planets of our solar system are constantly connected to the center of our galaxy with intergalactic Birkeland currents. Birkeland currents are strings of electricity which, my, which have many recognizable patterns of which the most important to understand are the magnetics because they are the easiest to see with their eyes. Matter accumulates magnetically. The heat is provided by electricity, simply put. Every electric current has a magnetic field, sphere. Yeah, it's a tube if it's a current. Uh, it's a sphere if it's a plasmoid. And every magnet has, an electric, has electric currents flowing around and through it, the magnetic flux. Every living being is an electromagnetic by nature and every natural process can be explained, explained with electromagnetism. It is scalable from the atomic realm up to the cosmic size. Peat or torf is known to most people around the world. It can be found on every continent on Earth. Peatlands, which also includes mires, bogs, muskets, and moors, are easily recognizable since they have a distinct look, as well as from the ground level as from above. They often have a brownish or reddish color and water bodies. It has been used by people for centuries in different ways. Some preserved their food in it, others used it for leather processing, processing, and people were even buried in it. Nowadays, peat is still used in different ways, that is mostly by the industrial sector. Two main uses make it still somewhat important for modern society. One is through burning it for electricity production or as fertilizer in agriculture. The use of peat for industrial purposes is not without contradiction due to its impact on the environment. Peatlands are usually wetlands, which means they have to be drained in order to make it accessible for machines. This includes deforestation, the excavation of drainage channels, construction of roads and other facilities. Flora and fauna will suffer greatly. When water bodies are getting altered artificially, Usually the influence of these changes come to light in extreme conditions such as drought or flood conditions. In dry conditions, peat can get lifted aloft and the very fine dust produces problems in the respiratory systems of the population in the vicinity. Another aspect of dried out peatlands, either artificially or naturally, is the danger of long-lasting subsurface fires, which are very hard to distinguish. There are different kinds of peatlands, but their origin or forming processes remains largely unknown. It is believed 
that peat accumulates very slowly over a long, ti long time period, approximately one millimeter per year. This kind of explanation fits perfectly into the uniform materialistic paradigm where everything happens very slowly and gradually. So slow that it is almost impossible to see or even to reproduce a theory in a laboratory in order to prove or disprove the theory. It is impossible to recreate a scientific laboratory experiment which lasts, for example, 5,432 years. Totally impossible. Nonetheless, the use of very long time scales in science is rather common and used in different branches of mainstream science such as geology and cosmology. Furthermore, certain agreements made upon scientific consensus which do not allow any new information to penetrate into the already agreed theory. Gatekeepers and peer-reviewing processes make sure that nothing will enter the established paradigm. It is ignorance towards new perspectives and ignorance is the opposite of nations. The very word from which the word science is derived from. Did you know that? Anyway. This alone is very ironic by itself, but the reason for this is quite likely the dogmatization and commercialization of science. In other words, science doesn't search for the ultimate truth. Its goal is ultimate profit, is sure funding, and therefore is keen to keep all the mysteries alive from whom the biggest money is expected through political agendas. These processes of scientific agreement on theories which are based more on assumptions than on actual facts, no reproduction in laboratories, has no or very few repetitive patterns and also often lacks the ability of prediction, is known as a belief system. The theory falls apart at the moment it is not believed in anymore. Facts don't care about anyone's beliefs nor feelings. They stand all on their own. Coffee break. In this paper, the author brings forward a new theory about peat, its creation and role in its, and therefore also our environment. The author lives in Finland, the peat richest country in the world. The Finnish name of Finland is Suomi. Suo means swamp, wetland. So it seems to be a place which identifies itself with it. The internet is full of texts, chemical analyses and economic calculations about peat. It also became part of the climate change conversation as a source of CO2, which is one of the main reasons why it works as a fertilizer, provided by nature itself. Oh yeah. You can find really accurate maps and all sorts of things related to peat. Many scientific papers have been written about the topic, but nowhere is explained how exactly it came into existence. It remains also rather unclear what it is, in terms of biology and or geology. So it is seen as a geomorphological phenomenon, quite much like metamorphosed rock. It's just there and people figured out how to make use out of it. We know quite accurately what it is made of, that there are differences between different peatlands. A, holi a holistic explanation of what it is, is missing. It remains a geomorphological phenomenon, which might sound very scientific, scientific, but the words used to describe it reveal also that it isn't understood. The only agreed consensus about it is that it is a phenomenon. Several questions must be asked. About peat must be asked. What is it? Where did it come from? How did it form? Why is something like peat found on Earth? Could its dielectric properties have any influence on its environment? Why is it dielectric in the first place? Are there indications of peat interacting with its environment? The end of the last ice age, approximately 12,000 years ago, was a very significant event. It made it possible for life to spread all over the globe again. Life didn't disappear during the, life, during the Ice Age. It got reduced in quantity and confined in places where it was possible to survive. Near the equator. Several theories exist about how the Great Melting occurred. They agree more or less on one specific topic. 
which is that the melting seems to have happened rather quickly. What else than the sun could have provided the energy for it? The question remains of how it happened. The albedo effect of white surfaces such as of snow and ice pose somewhat of a problem. Geothermal heat has to be taken into consideration. It is part of volcanism. This, on the other hand, implies yet another mystery. How is the heat beneath our feet produced? Some propose, per, propose that Earth's core is a molten ball of iron and the heat is produced by nuclear processes due to the immense pressure. How is it then possible that Earth's thermosphere, which starts about 85 kilometers over the surface of Earth and extends about to 500 kilometers altitude, can exhibit temperatures of 2000 degrees Celsius or more, if the heat of Earth is supposedly to come from its core? Something really doesn't match up in many common things still teached in schools or even universities. The following text tries to bring some new viewpoints to this topic in a fresh way. Common sense, a holistic view and interdisciplinary scientific evidence are crucial points of attitude which will guide us throughout this text. Chapter 2. Comparison of different theories about peat and other contradictions in modern science. We will start this chapter with two quotes in order to show some basic contradictions within the topic. Quote number one from the FAO Bulletin, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Peats are generally considered to be partially decomposed biomass, vegetation. They show a wide range in degree of decomposition. Kurbatov, 1968, briefly summarizes 35 years of research into the formation of peat as follows. <coughs> the formation of peat is a relatively short biochemical process carried carried on under the influence of aerobic microorganisms in the surface layer of the deposits during periods of low subsoil water. As the peat, which is formed in the peat producing layer, <laughs> becomes subjected to anaerobic conditions in the deeper layers of the deposit, it is preserved and shows comparatively little change with time. Quote number two from Wikipedia. Peat usually accumulates slowly at the right rate of about a millimeter per year. There seems to be some contradictions between those two quotes time-wise. It also is hard to distinguish between formation and accumulation. The first quote refers to a rather short process, but the second quote refers to a slow process. For some reasons, the author hasn't been able to find any satisfying explanation of how peat got or gets formed. There is evidence in literature that peat got formed in certain times in history, like 12,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, maybe even 3,500 years ago. It is obvious that the creation dates correlate to some degree with sun cycles. Then for like you, you get the link to this paper, and all these are references. These are links to papers and stuff. You can check all them out, but that's up to you. But we also need to take into account what our ancestors recorded for us to decipher. The author thinks that it is possible that peat forms more or less in a cyclical pattern. Also should be taken into account that the creation of peat might happen regionally. In other words, plants and other biological mass from a certain time period at a certain place might have persisted whilst another location of the same aged biomass turned into peat. Eventually got mixed up by winds or other meteorological processes and functioned as a fertilizer. Quite like it is still used in modern society. It is a natural process, so it shouldn't be a surprise that nature works this way. 
In the first quote, a biochemical process is mentioned. So we have to talk about the meaning of the word biochemical, which is obviously constructed of, constructed of two words. It is very interesting because it is a very interesting word because it forces us to think about life itself. Somewhere has to be made a distinction between dead matter and matter which is alive. The two parts of living and non-living things are called biotic, alive, and apiotic, not alive. Somewhere the line between living and not living has to be drawn. Something which has been done already many times throughout history. It is one of the most fundamental questions of all, and of course the discussion is not over yet. In the author's opinion, a form of distinguishment could be made by defining the amount and relative amount to each other of closed and open electric circuits in a being or entity. Closed circuits are processes which are happening within the entity. Things like our blood circuitry, muscle movement or the movement of water within a plant from the roots all the way up out to the leaves are measurable processes which ceases to exist or which cease to exist that the processes inheriting entity cannot maintain a certain energy flow within itself. They are more or less confined within the being. They have often a physical form, are measurable and are in some cases also visible with the naked eye. In many cases, they also exhibit certain patterns which are also seen in nature's electric display. For example, our way network has the shape of lightning. There are an energy circuit after all. We are made of things like blood plasma, which besides other functions, contributes heat throughout our bodies. Our blood contains iron, which is a very important part of our blood energy circuit. Every living being needs to have a certain amount of closed circuits in order to be an entity. No entity can exist without interacting with its environment, but the environment doesn't need the entity. All chemical processes are electrical in nature, and therefore we have to understand that changes in the electromagnetic environment can either slow down or speed up those processes. In the char if the charge increases and reaches a certain intensity threshold, we notice rapid changes. In an electrical environment, changes can happen lightning fast, literally. Earth is a capacitor in space in which everything is connected and therefore no islands are there to be found. Earth has geographic poles and magnetic poles. This is something everybody knows, but the deeper meaning of it doesn't seem to be part of mainstream science. By deeper meaning, I mean the fact that wherever there is a magnetic field, there is also an electric current and vice versa. This has been discovered accidentally already in 18... 20 by Ørsted. Earth's magnetosphere and its magnetic poles existence has to be considered as undeniable proof of an electric current flowing through planet Earth. But electricity is often ignored as being a part of natural processes, especially in cosmology. It even seems that the use of the word electricity is consciously avoided. Gravity is not understood by mainstream science. Sometimes it, is even get, it even gets mystified, like in this article from the New Scientist, where seven things which don't make sense about gravity are listed. The author doubts that this article was written by someone in his free time, so we have to understand it as either something written in a state of nations or as purposely made this information. It is not surprising to find many mysteries in science, like mysteries about the aforementioned gravitational force, because it is simply not a force itself. It is only an effect of electromagnetism. The electrical force is 10 to the 38th, the value varies between 10 to the 36th or 39th times stronger than gravity. And Einstein's theory of gravity has been debunked several times. Greetings to Cothard. This has to be taken very seriously. It will change the perception of reality and many mysteries will cease to exist. Pieces will fall. 
naturally into place through a natural understanding of attraction and repulsion, frequency, resonance and geometry of the mechanics on every scale. Nature doesn't waste anything, ever. And peat is a great example for this. It is not only peat, but also metamorphosed rock, volcanism, weather, history, mythology, religion and astronomy, which is poorly understood, but also soil, soil organic matter, SOM, in general. In other words, according to common theory, most things are unknown or mysterious, a proven fact since they admit it by themselves. Yeah, I mentioned again. Go to the paper and check all those links, all those papers or articles or whatever they are. And go out to figure and if you have checked them out, go on and check the rest. But anyway, let's go on with that. Despite this fact, all kinds of rules and laws are implied in regards to the use of peat, conservation and protection of peatlands. The arising question is, is there a possibility that this also happens in other realms and topics than peat related? Is answered with a yes. In order to prove the ignorance of mainstream science towards certain scientific discoveries and paradigms, which could have changed the path of humanity for the better decades ago, through a better understanding of our environment, history and mythology. I listed a few important names and their works, which didn't get and still are not getting the attention, acknowledgement and respect they would have deserved and still deserve. The author is aware of this not being the correct way to present names and works in a scientific paper. But this way the author makes sure that these names are noticed by the reader. Christian Birkeland, seven times Nobel Prize nominee. Seven times. And I think he never got one. Hannes Alfen, Nikola Tesla, Immanuel Velikovsky, Ralph Jürgens, Halton Arp, Anthony Peratt, Michael Steinbacher, David Talbot, Val Thornhill, C.J. Random, Ransom, Victor Schauberger. Pete and its properties, which sometimes also includes its electrical nature, is studied all around the world. It is partially decayed organic matter, but, quote from the International Peat and Society, Definitions of peat vary across disciplines and between authorities for different purposes. And there is no universal agreement that is applicable in all circumstances. Let's read this again. Quote from the International Peatland Society. Definitions of peat vary across disciplines now that's already very interesting in itself but and between authorities for different purposes <laughs> really and there is no universal agreement that it is applicable in all circumstances okay the International Peatland Society was founded in Canada, 1968, but is now a registered NGO in Jyväskylä. Yeah, Finland. Jyväskylä, Jyvä means somehow, what is it? Like if you have, if you try to make bread, you get the, from the field. I don't get the word in my head. The seeds, it's not corn anyway. But from what you make the bread. And it's basically, if you would translate uvascular into, I think it's maybe, what is it, Israel language? What, what language are they talking in Israel? Anyway, uvascular would mean Bethlehem. It's actually 
quite literally the same thing. Jyväskylä means Bethlehem. But I have been talking about this some time ago. You, we will probably find a video about this. Anyway. The scientific investigation into the mystery of Pete is a vast field with many different approaches. One of the newer viewpoints of the topic of Pete has become the climate change discussion. Joseph Fourier might be the first who proposed CO2 being the main driver behind climate change in the year 1827. The whole discussion about the role of CO2 as the main driver of terrestrial climate change tied to the Industrial Revolution doesn't make any sense at all. It is instrumentalized as a political tool and not based on logic nor evidence. Major doesn't and couldn't work in a such a self-destructible way. No life could have ever emerged. We only have to look at what plants need to grow. Light, water, CO2. Yeah, maybe some other things, but anyway. But CO2. Quote from the Oklahoma State University. Photosynthesis is the process which involves a chemical reaction between water and carbon dioxide, CO2, in the presence of light to make food sugars for the plants. And as a byproduct, it releases oxygen in the atmosphere. Yeah, ain't nature pretty clever? This means that CO2 is a very important part of Earth's atmosphere. Without it, life couldn't exist. Back in the days, so to say, when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, the CO2 content of the atmosphere was much higher than it is nowadays. Some of the dinosaurs were very big and they conclusively also needed very much food, which obviously also got provided. Only with a much higher content of CO2 in the atmosphere, the plants could have provided enough food for the dinosaurs. Yeah. That's the CO2 curve. And now it seems to go up a little bit. A simple diagram shows how the CO2 content of Earth's atmosphere declined over time and it also could give some people headaches. The overall charge potential of planet Earth also had a big influence on the size of the species. A higher charge potential, potential means a stronger gravitational pull. This indicates that planet Earth seems to grow and the species are getting smaller. As demonstrated above, many topics in mainstream science are still largely unknown, mysterious or even enigmatic, despite science being announced to be settled. An obvious contradiction, we have now the possibility finally go into a new interpretation, concept or theory about the geomorphological phenomenon called PEAT. Chapter 3. Creation and Accreation of Pete from a New Perspective Let's go back in time, let's say 17,000 years or so. Some parts of Earth were covered by ice and snow, but there were also vast forests and grasslands that covered the surface of the Earth. Huge herds of animals fed on the abundant food sources. Some settlements of people were found rather sparsely contributed over the landscape. This assumption could be totally wrong. The amount of people, the size and amount of the settlements could have been much bigger than ever anyone could have imagined. It is mainly based on archaeological findings within the paradigm of consensus theory, but it is not a crucial part of this paper to discuss whether there were many and sophisticated cultures present or not. We are treating all animals, people and plants equally as biomass because all biomass on Earth is based on carbon. In a study of the inorganic chemistry of peat in the Okavango Delta system in Botswana is stated about the origin of inorganic matter, quote, Alohdonos kaolinite 40% and quartz 20. And both alohdonos and autohdonos phytolithic silica 30%. Several inorganic components, uh, iron, 
potassium, uh, anyway, salt, and magnesium, which make up the remaining 10%, are associated with the organic fraction. It is important to understand what the words allochthonos and autochthonos mean in order to point out something significant. Autochthonos means that the minerals were found at the same place as they were formed. They were created in situ. Allochthonos, on the other hand, means that they were formed somewhere else. In other words, they don't know where they came from. The term for something in between is paraautochthonos. Despite this not being relevant, the author likes to mention it here and for the sake of completeness. And it is a funny word after all. Parautochthonos. Phytolytic silica is still an unsolved problem in botany. Plants somehow create cell-sized or even several cells combined sized silica deposits that also have the form of a cell. The reason for why or how exactly it happens remains unclear. These parts of plants have CO2 and other chemical compounds stored within this piece of silica. Because it is silica, it does not decay for thousands of years. As earlier mentioned, we have 30% silica and also 20% quartz in peat. At least in this particular case. Quartz and silica are the same material, so why are they mentioned this way? The difference between the two lies in the arrangement of the atoms. Silica is amorphous and quartz is crystalline. The easiest way to explain the difference between the two is the production of glass. Quartz-rich sand or quarried quartz, rock quartz, gets heated up to about 1700 degrees, the melting point of quartz, by which the crystalline structure disappears and gets clear. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to watch out of the window due to the fraction of the crystalline structure of quartz. Of course, the process of glass making is much more complex. Many other things take place like taking out impurities and adding chemicals, which is basically just changing the impurities, in order to make the melting point lower. The finding... no. The final properties of glass can also be influenced by the cooling process either slow or fast. Some glass also is chemically treated in order to get a very hard surface. This process is called ion exchange process, which exchanges sodium ions with potassium ions in a salty solution. Most glass produced is a mixture of three main ingredients and therefore called soda lime glass or water glass. Commonly, mixture is 70% silica, rock quartz is used more often than sand, 10% lime calcium oxide, and 50% soda. The fact that peat contains amorphous silica indicates that it must have experienced some kind of extreme heating, at least some 700 degrees. When searching for sources of heat, common theory refers usually to volcanic activity geothermal activity or heat which occurs deep underground in order to provide an explanation. Sometimes asteroid impacts are also used as a, as a source for heat, which could also be possible in very rare occasions. We know that Earth is a capacitor in space, so we have to take fluctuations in Earth's electric, electric circuitry into account and remember the scalability of them. The amount of energy the universe could provide is immense and hard to imagine. All the different layers of Earth contain energy. The atmosphere with its many layers is no exception. Everybody has experienced lightning. It is an at atmospheric discharge event except it is positive lightning. Rising up from the ground which can be seen as a ground discharging event. A lightning bolt has an approximate heat of 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 27,760 degrees Celsius. This amount of heat would easily evaporate silica and many other minerals or materials. It changes its state from liquid to gas at 2,900 degrees until 1,414 Celsius degrees. It is solid. Polar lights or aurora borealis produce up to 1400 Kelvin, 
1126.85 temperatures. It might be also much higher. Earth's magnetic field is weakening, the poles are on the move and we are experiencing already many kinds of changes in weather, seismicity and then volcanic activity. Yeah, actually. Yeah, I think I wanted to show you still something I spotted some time ago since we are talking about volcanic activity here. Volcanic activity. Let me show you still something about volcanic activity. Because I've been making, obviously, 27 videos about volcanic activity. <laughs> and uh, you can find also here, first, plasma volcanologist. Yeah, this wasn't my idea <laughs> to figure out this kind of title. But thank you very much, Shifu. That was a very cool thing to do. From here you can also find the Volcanic Plasma Phenomena playlist. So now let me show you something new. But first I just want to show you a few thumbnails. Maybe... I don't know if there's any good one here. Yeah, maybe here you can see something. But obviously that's in the night. And now I have... Some time ago I... I saw the first time something similar going on in daylight. So that's a basic screen recording. And I want you to keep your focus somewhere here. Maybe here. But we go we will I will show it to you. You won't miss it. Did you see it? Now let's go back. It's here. And that's real time now. Now you see it. Now it's gone. So now let's zoom in on this. And that's original speed still. Yeah, it looks like a cloud. It actually is a cloud, I think. Most plasmas are clouds, after all. And also the timing. Because if you watch... Here we have the eruption. And this is happening at the exact same time, like very often. Or almost all of those Fuego plasmoids or plasma things I captured, they happened at the exact moment of the eruption. Now. And it's amazing how fast this is moving, because you can check the time here. That's real time. Yeah, normal cloud, normal clouds don't move like that. Uh. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, maybe in the night this would be glowing, I guess, you know? No, it doesn't look like much, except it's creepy moves. Yeah, let's just have one last look at this and... Then I will leave you alone. Yeah. Thanks.